Now I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into who NCV Enterprises are today. They've brought forward their opinion through Billy Fitzgerald. So just exactly who are NCV Enterprises and who is controlling the decisions that go on in NCV Enterprises. But before I get on to that, uh, this is actually the uh, ATSIC extract searches that have been done and the current company information. These have all been uploaded um, for anyone to look at. The document that I'm using is actually the extract summary where I've put all the information together so that uh, it's a lot more simpler than going over pages and pages. Most of them are only one page. Uh, some go into two only because I have listed the documents list and what they are at the bottom. So this is all the search information or extract information and the 10 documents that are listed. Now if you go to ATSIC or document search on the web, there are no more documents lodged past the 7th of October, so all of this information is current. And you see at the time it's also hard to discover when there was the movement of shares because they actually give dates for uh, when sh uh, directors and secretaries are appointed and ceased but not when shareholders actually buy in. That's where you have to go through uh, some of the time <laughs> and actually look through the documents here and find where there was something lodged where the share structure was changed or an issue of shares. Because every time someone becomes a shareholder or there's a change in shareholdings, they have to do that through lodging a document. And that, that's why I've created summary, extract summaries for all of the ones that I've um, found out for sure who's actually behind them. And it's not just the director and secretary with the NICAP or Mingimble members that you need to look at because essentially the director and secretary are the ones that are acting on the wishes of the shareholders. This is the way that it has always been intended to set up any of the companies that uh, are the, the legal shell that they use for the members to control the activities of that company through their shareholdings. So in a lot of, well, all shareholders, all directors, and, and secretaries have to answer to the shareholders and it's the shareholders that make the decisions. Some companies the shareholders give the directors a lot of discretion to make decisions without getting the shareholders permission to you know act in certain business activities without having to go running for permission every time. So essentially the director and secretary of a company are the tools that the shareholders use to enact their wishes through. And if the directors are not enacting the shareholders' wishes, well, that's when you get issues in companies and company directors get into trouble and things like that. Now, let's look at who is the director and secretary. Sole director is Cherie Francis Stokes, who I can now confirm is also known as Cherie Nightcap. Now before there was NCV Enterprises, we know that the evolution of the, th the property at 322 Kyogle Road was first looked at as the Bulla Bulla community. Mark Darwin looked at setting it up through several companies that he had set up but when he couldn't get finance, they couldn't use those member companies then, they then used other member companies. And even though Wollumbin Dreamtime was also set up to do that, it didn't end up being that, it ended up being Wollumbin Horizons. 
And it was also the intent that both the commercial part of the nightcap on Minjimbal and the residential at 3222 would be in separate companies and that they would be kept separate and which they have done because Cherie Stokes again is also in Mount Burrell Commercial. She was just reappointed uh, the, late last year after Philip Dixon had been the sole director. So when you're looking at a company you're not so much looking in the case of Nightcap on Minjimbal, the director and the secretary, but who the shareholders are and who the majority shareholders are that hold all the sway and opinion and decision making. Like it was always the intent to actually um, have a few outside members hold shares in Mount Burrell Commercial. Um, but they would never have any active say in what went on in the business because their share distribution was too small and it outweighs all the majority of shareholders who, through one name or another, are actually NICAP on Minjimbal members. So ultimately, if you've bought into um, Mount Burrell Commercial and you've not become a member of the community, and you're not voicing um, the common herd mentality of the mindset of what the community wants to achieve, not you, you've got no say. And uh, Ry Merthealer has found this out, that his 200 shares are worth nothing. And likewise with these Jesk Holdings and Winner Super, they only recently bought in, I'm pretty sure that was April 2020 that they bought in, but I'd have to confirm that. But um, So who are the shareholders behind NCV Enterprises? Who is directing Cherie Francis Stokes or aka Cherie Nightcap? And you know, people might have seen Cherie Nightcap and Rich Nightcap out there. Um, Yes, they're all promoting these things, but Cherie's doing it under the name of Cherie Nightcap, not Cherie Stokes. So Yadaki Capital is the majority shareholder. Derek Zillman and Michelle Zillman have got 45 shares, and Nyepi Proprietary Limited has got 45 shares. And Jesk Holdings and Winner Super have got two and one shares. Now I've actually put that red total down there because if all this share distribution is correct and you add it up, there's actually 1,093 shares, but there's only 1,091, well sorry there, 1,091 on the actual ATSIC extract. So there's a two share discrepancy in what is showing up as the share distribution. I mean, this is what is actually in the extracts. I've just added them up so that you can see that adds to 1,093, and yet there's only supposed to be 1,091. So there is clearly not a proper distribution of shares going on. And hey, that's not an accusation. That's on the paperwork. Check it out, Billy Boy. <laughs> Alrighty, so one thing I didn't point out is that the when the Wollumbin Horizons had gone into liquidation and there was no other company to take over control of that, that's when they registered NCV Enterprises. So one follows on from the other and because Adrian Brannock became a bankrupt that they had to change everything. But oops, that's Yadaki Developments. Well, they are associated. I have to bring that one up anyway. Hang on, where are we? There we go. Yadaki Capital. So Yadaki Capital holds the majority shares. The director and secretary is Mark McMurtry and Derek Zillman. The shareholders are Zillman nominees, 
Nyepi Proprietary Limited and First in Time. Now, I want you to pay attention to Nyepi because Nyepi was solely 100% Adrian Brennock until he moved that share into his wife's name just before his final bankruptcy hearing. And he was also, and still is, listed as the sole shareholder of Lumban Horizons. So the person that actually put Wollumbin Horizons into liquidation is now hiding behind Nyepi Proprietary Limited after the company has been phoenixed back by NCV. And we know that NCV Enterprises is the purchaser of 3222 as this was confirmed by Stephen Starts when he advised and confirmed that payment had been made in full and that NCV Enterprises were the people that purchased it. So, Wollumbin Horizons, Adrian Brannock, NCV, I will show you Nyepi, I've shown you Nyepi before, is Adrian Brannock, put into his wife's name because he was going bankrupt. But through Nyepi, he also controls a large number of other shares, as you can see, in, he maintains his share in NCV Enterprises through Nyepi. And I mean, he is the developer and he has been the developer, as he said in their official video, for over four years. And that puts him in a time frame when he's saying that, well, you're only marketing? No, mate, you're not marketing. You are profiting out of this. This is your business. You have financial shares and interests in it. And those financial shares now are being investigated. They are actually being investigated on what you've done to actually hide from your bankruptcy by moving shares in Nyepi into your wife's name. You know it's illegal. You should ask Mark Darwin because he apparently knows Bondi and he'll tell you that, yeah, buying stuff in your wife's name may have worked for him. They change laws after that, and it won't work for you. Now, just to point out here, too, that Yudaki Capital is Zilman nominees, Nyepi, and First in Time. Now, Zilman nominees is Derek Zilman, and I'm pretty sure it's his wife as well. I'm not sure, but anyway, it's still Derek Zilman. The wives are just something that they use or partners that they use to put something in their name because they don't want it in their name personally or they can't in Adrian Brennock's case because Nyepi is Adrian Brennock through Christy Brennock and first in time is 100% Mark McMurtry. Now, I'd bring up an interesting thing here that the objections that have been made have specified objections specifically about Pete Evans, about Adrian Brannock and about Philip Dixon and yet I have done so much on Mark McMurtry and yet Mark McMurtry seems to have more of an interest that you would think that you would specify more to and all the stuff I said on Mark McMurtry as well. I mean just curious Billy and maybe Mark McMurtry might like to know too is that why isn't what's been said about him important enough to actually even raise that question when you're trying to threaten people to shut their mouths? Pete Evans, yeah. Adrian Brannock, yeah. Philip Dixon, yeah. But why not Mark McMurtry? Why aren't you representing his interests as well? Or you say you're representing that through NCV Enterprises. Well, if that was the case, you wouldn't need to mar uh, note Adrian Brannock because it's, it's clearly obvious. You've got Nyepi involved. That's Adrian Brannock. He moved the controlling share so it couldn't be seized off him because, he, oh, it's not in my name now, look. It's not mine. <laughs> yeah. That's why they have laws that say that they can go back a certain time and take anything that you did give to people like that. They can take it back. And especially if it's done 
<laughs> within a week of his final bankruptcy hearing where he's trying to get it overturned and he doesn't know whether they're going to say yes or no but he's moved his share in Nyepi in his wife, into his wife's name because he thinks, well, just in case, it won't be in my name so they can't take it. Well, of course they can. You know, you haven't been looking at enough laws and I know that Adrian Brennock and Mark Darwin have got this really warped uh, interpretation of the laws, which is how they can try and explain so many of the th things that they have told people to do with accounting and debts and everything that is just so highly illegal and wow setting people up for a fall but you know they put it out there that they've found this loophole in the system well i think you know if you get old enough you actually realize that most loopholes end up sucking the people in and chewing them up and when they and when jail spits them out at the end of it they're never the same Loopholes are, you know, you're, you're, you're skating on thin ice. Alright, so here's the Nyepi summary showing that Christy Bonot became sole director and secretary and the transfer of shares as by the lodge documents down here show that on that particular date Adrian Brenock transferred his shares. So on the 8th of August, and his final bankruptcy hearing was on the 14th of August 2018. On the 8th of August, Adrian Brennock transferred the, all of Nyepi, the directorship and shares into his wife's name. And then a lot of other companies, which I won't go into right now, he was a shareholder in and he changed those shares out of his name and into the name of Nyepi. So Nyepi now holds the shares that Adrian Brennock previously held. Adrian Brennock put the shares in Nyepi's name through his wife. Now all this information does actually come from ASIC information extracts and whilst all care has been taken in making these extract summaries, which, you know, you've got to allow for 1% or 0.1% error, um, little things that I notice that I've made errors on that I've corrected. But for all intensive purposes, these are just representations of gathering all the information. Because you, you look at one like Mount Barrel Commercial, and I've got 30 extracts and to find out when someone actually bought in as a shareholder as I said that isn't dated so you need to look more as to when the documents were lodged at ATSIC and when the shares changed. So directly or indirectly there are several people that are involved with NCV when Billy Fitzgerald says that he represents uh, NCV Enterprises. Now, I'm only going to deal with the first letter that's got the, what, the 10th of July on the first page and the 6th of October on the second page. That was first addressed to Kerry Cashel and was about a private email that she had sent to Pete Evans. And then Pete Evans forwarded it on where, to Derek Zillman and CC'd in Adrian Brannock, Rich Moat and oh, somebody else I think, can't remember off the top of my head, but um, yeah. Now this was a private communication that Pete Evans chose to forward on and he didn't all make any kind of instruction in the email, the part that I got that he forwarded on to Derek Zillman on to do anything. So I don't know how NCV Enterprises can write a letter about an email that I sent to Pete Evans and wasn't actually addressed to them 
And what I say privately to other people is, I'm sorry, but you can't turn around and say, well, that's a publication and you can now be had up for it. It's like, hey, it was your choice, Pete Evans' choice, to completely ignore it. And you can quote the document on what he actually said when he passed it on. He didn't say, I'm so offended by this, I'm so upset. No, he just forwarded it on to Derek Zillman to uh, do what he wanted with it. And he goes to Billy Fitzgerald and they come up with, oh, well, let's, let's threaten her because, you know, we think we's, that she's acting with Gillian Norman and they're breaching an injunction because they're working together. I mean, come on. That is the most pathetic pathetic shit I've ever heard. You know, if you want to say what I've, I've said, not what other people have said, I mean, come on. If you can't actually have a go at me because of my own words and actions, there is something wrong with your letter writing, Billy Boy. Which is why, you know, really, the rest of them that come after that don't even deserve a look at is really what what do you actually know are you just writing letters that oh look I can pick this out and make a thread of it whether it's true or not you I mean seriously when you actually write letters like that there should be actually some foundation in the truth of what you're actually claiming to represent you don't actually try and say that anything that you know, you're not trying to prove that anything your clients have said is correct. And you haven't even, well, you can't even prove the stuff that I've said is not correct. Because I can say, I can show the stuff that shows I am not, this is not hearsay. You know, and what is hearsay, I say is hearsay. Like I've got a few theories that I'm pondering at the moment as to how much control the directors and secretaries actually have in all the member companies and who is really directing the shareholders and the shareholders' interests in these companies to direct those member assets. And you have to remember that these companies that they've all created to hide behind and do stuff with are member assets. They are to divulge themselves personally of any responsibility. And I guarantee you, any monies. Well, Yudaki Capital has to have, it's got 1,000 shares in NCV Enterprises. Now, in NCV Enterprises shares are only valued at $1,091. They just paid over $2 million for a property. And they're only worth $1,091. This is why there is just so much that goes on with the, in the, the different companies and the discrepancy of the two shares where, you know, if you break down all the current shareholders, add them up, it's simple maths. I did it over and over again because I'm thinking, surely they should be able to take all the current shareholders and come up with the total shares and know that that's a correct number. But no, they're just clearly using information that is put on a form that someone else put there. Someone who clearly can't add that 1,000, 45, 45, 2 and 1 makes 1,093, not 1,091. So, you know, that's just bad maths. And that is just part of their bad record keeping. It is a continual thing that is used. When they go to court, they can say, well, I don't know what really went on. And the court can't really see what went on because, you know, nobody's got any good books of all the activities that went on. We've only got bits and pieces. And so nobody can make anything stick because there's too many loopholes and stuff that's missing because of their bad record keeping. 
And I might remind that it is required by law to keep good records. Not having good records, using bad records as an excuse, you can only get away with that so many times before, guess what? Now you're going to be held accountable for consistently breaching the Corporates Act where you are required by law to keep proper records and your excuses don't wash anymore. But one thing of note here is the current registered office. This current registered office, this registered office shows up in 99% of the member companies. Cavill Park offices, Suite 38, Level 4, 46 Cavill Ave Surface Paradise. That is Medora's accounting. They are all using it as a registered office, an accounting firm. And then they turn around and they say that they don't have good accounting records. Well, I think it's time that people did a little bit more digging into the records that are held at the registered office for all these companies. Start questioning the person that runs Medoras. I'm not sure whether that's Peter Hetherington or who it may be right now, but uh, they all use this particular address, whether it's <laughs> registered in New South Wales or Queensland. They use registered office at the Cavill Park offices. All the same. And there's also been a lot of companies like Yudaki Capital and Yudaki Development. They were all registered on the same day. Uh, there was, oh, well, there's one day three different companies were created by different members. So there's a lot of activities that are going on that can be, you can see it in the ATSIC extracts. It's not a matter of trying to prove something that is written in black and white. And these are supposed to be the proper records. Although, as I said, you know, this, this two share discrepancy. Can you answer that, Billy? Why NCV Enterprises has got a two share discrepancy? What happened to the other two shares? Why are there not 1,093 total shares? The share distribution does add up. You can use the links I've provided to check these searches for yourself and find out that these are correct. These are the correct share distributions as is right now. 1,000 shares to Yudaki Capital, 45 shares to Derek and Michelle Zillman, 45 shares to Nyepi or Adrian Brennock through his wife, and two shares to Jesk Holdings and one share to Winner Super. So either it's a mistake that ATSIC haven't processed some paperwork yet, that is a correction of share distribution, which, hey, that was your last document that you lodged was actually request for correction. So your request for correction didn't make it correct. It still doesn't add up. You still have not justified how you've got 1,093 shares sold when you're only claiming 1,091. Where is the two share discrepancy? So that's just a little question that, well, Billy Fitzgerald, you can ask your client in CV Enterprises because there are things that, um, lots of things that we will bring out. Uh, all my videos that I've uploaded where I've looked at all these, they will be bought in. And you, Billy, need to be prepared to find a solicitor for yourself to represent you when you go into the witness box too, because yeah, you're going on the stand too, boy. I'm not leaving you out of this. You've had uh, a nice, fair share and part in this and uh, you don't get to miss out. So you can represent NICAP on Minjimbal or NCV Enterprises and Adrian Brannock and Philip Dixon but when you get on the stand and you're asked questions you may want to have someone there to represent you. Okay? Just 
giving you the little bit of a heads up because you know you can't even as a lawyer just go writing any dribble that you think might be correct you have to in good conscience have some estimation that what you're writing is correct and I'm sorry but I can't expect that as an intelligent person that you would actually think a lot of that is correct what your clients have told you if you looked at any of the links that Anne had sent you, the liquidator, the bankruptcy trustee, LinkedIn, AB, as well as many others, including the tax office, you've had more than enough opportunity to know what is going on. So you cannot claim ignorance and turn around and make accusations that you know cannot have any foundation in the facts. You've seen these documents, you've been given links, and quite frankly, well, it's not anyone else's problem but your own if you didn't pay attention to all those emails you were CC'd in. This was regarding your clients in CV Enterprises that you're so willing to stand up for. So if you had done your due diligence, you would have followed every link. And if there was anything wrong with them, I'm sure that you would have responded in those emails and told Anne that she had things wrong. So why didn't you respond? Now you know what I think, Billy. I'm pretty convinced that the only reason that you bought out anything in the first place was because you think I am working for Gillian Norman. And this isn't about getting me. This is about getting Gillian Norman. Because we know, well, anyone that knows anything about NICAP knows what a vendetta, especially Adrian Brannock got against Gillian Norman. I have seen so many posts where they mock and defame her. Yes, they mock and defame her. They call her names. And one day they will be held accountable for everything they say. And that day is coming because, you know, my efforts are on the criminal aspect of it. But there are others going for a civil aspect that, well, let's hope they make the right target. But then where is our target, eh? Where is Mark McMurtry? Seems to have done a runner from 3222. I wonder why that is. And that's right at the time when they've bared up the hill making it look like they're going to stick in lots, like a subdivision or something like that. Pretty logical that he might want to move out at the time too because, well, hell, who wants to move to the country and be surrounded by bloody houses? Take a good look at their dream plan. It's suburbia in the country with no running water, no electricity, no good roads, and more rules of a smaller group of mindset that now you've got to obey. And you'll find out that, you know what, the government is so nice compared to these dictators that you find in these smaller communities who dictate to you what you can and can't say. And if you say the wrong thing, well, you'll be like all the past lost investors. You know, if you don't play along with their game, if you call them out, Oh, you're out. And then they'll bring all the lawyers and everything against you to show that, well, look, you're wrong and I'm right. Well, the thing is that bringing this all out in court, Billy, is the only way to show that your clients have been <laughs> less than honest. Very much so. And whilst the presentation and the evidence put forward in the courts in the past, which I've seen, was not enough to prove that what your clients are saying is down and outright, well, let's just say it's kind of a stretch of the truth, isn't it? So many things. And especially the legal obligation that Adrian Brannock has as a bankrupt to divulge to anybody that he is giving out financial information to or that 
anything that they may put a financial investment into. As a marketing manager, huh, yeah, he might have a boss and he doesn't need to tell people that he's a bankrupt because he's representing the company, not himself. But as a developer with financial interests representing himself as the developer, he has an obligation to tell each and every person that he is an undischarged bankrupt, which he has failed to do. Now, you can try and argue that his position as developer is only in marketing, but I can tell you there is more than enough to give doubt to that story and the continuing story that Adrian Brennock gives out that his involvement in something is, oh, I, I'm not involved in it at all, it's all somebody else. I'm only an organiser through this company, you know. I, I've got nothing to do with Freedom Summits. I'm not a partner. I'm not a partner in Freedom Summits. I'm not a partner in Truthology. That's why I made that statement that I have been a partner for over nearly four years when he became part of the steering committee. These are statements he made. And a lot of it comes out of his own mouth or that of Mark Darwin to confirm it. Actually, Mark Darwin confirms that Adrian Brennock has not been up front, especially in court, about his involvement with Freedom Summits, Truthology, and also his ability to know what was going on in Wollumbin Horizons. No matter whether Adrian Brennock was the director or, oh, boo-hoo, they illegally removed me and somebody else went in and then finally I got back in, to say that you didn't know what was going on is 100% bullshit. And, you know, I'm not afraid to say that because I know what I've got. And I'm not, uh, well, I'm waiting for the day that it is all shown in court and proven. To wipe that smile off your smug little face, Adrian Brennock, you know, there is nothing worse than a liar that actually gets so full of themselves that they think that all their lies will continue to save them for the rest of their life. Ah, people don't understand. Sooner or later, everything catches up. You know, you don't escape anything. Even Mark Darwin would tell you that. You know, part of his sales pitch was, oh, I got a brain tumour. And that was because of who I was. And once I did the, the guru and changed my life and everything, I became well and I didn't even need surgery. I did it through becoming a better person. Well, now he's supposed to have bowel cancer. And where do you think that's supposed to have come from? Hmm? From being a nice person or being a fucking asshole? You know, and seriously, <laughs> sorry to be so blunt, but... You know, I have watched so many conversations with him in it. And, oh, I don't know, you feel like you've got to go and have a shower afterwards. It's just, yes. But anyway. Now, I've got a few other things for you, Billy, too. Because, you know, as I said, I've been watching a lot of your clients rubbish on their videos and all their sovereignty and birth certificate and you know, interlopers and how to deal with different things and how to essentially screw over other people, you know. Now, first of all, Billy, um, you are a third-party interloper. I've got no contract with you, okay? Secondly, there is no birth certificate with Kerry Cashel on it. Kerry Cashel has no legal identity no birth certificate. The person who is the legal person who has a birth certificate is not Kerry Cashel. Kerry Cashel has as much a birth certificate as Max Egan. And Max Egan is not a legal entity and can't be sued. Only the legal person can be held legally responsible. Do you get that? Did you understand that, Billy? 
I'm only using your client's own words and logic. This is their expectations that I'm putting back on to them, to you, to jump through hoops and deliver all this. You know, first of all, I'm not that person. <laughs> that legal person and the real person are two different people. So, you know, good luck. All right, following on with their mindset and logic, I am a sovereign being who you have no authority over. The laws in Australia are illegal and therefore you have no author legal authority to act or jurisdiction. I never ceded my rights to be governed, nor did I give consent to any laws. I don't recognise your authority and you have no jurisdiction over my sovereign being, the real person I am, not a legal corporation or dead entity. And any legal action against a legally identifiable person by their slave receipt or birth certificate can only be served against that legal entity and no other. This must include full name and date of birth and a copy of the birth certificate to ensure the person you are suing is a legally recognised entity. Once you have established this clear identity and the legal person responsible, you may then proceed to take legal action that I will not recognise because this system has no authority over my sovereignty and I don't recognise the Australian laws. Now, did I do that well? Did I do a good imitation of what your clients put out there? Huh? Have you watched any of their videos, Billy? Because this is the kind of crap that they, they come on with. But, you know, they have wasted a lot of the court's time over it. So, you know, I don't think the court would actually mind me wasting time over it. Having a go at you, asking you to produce the same stuff that your clients expect others to deliver and prove that they are the person. That, oh, I'm not this person because that person, well, my birth certificate is only a warehouse receipt. And the only person that actually legally exists is the person that's got the, the birth certificate. And since I don't recognise that I am a slave and that I'm owned by anyone, I'm a real person, not a dead uh, corporation. Well, we're two different things, so, you know, you cannot apply one to the other. So when you figure out who the real person is, that is a legal person, that you can also sue, then you, the third party interloper Billy, can sue that person. Because, as I've just pointed out, Kerry Cashel has no birth certificate and she has no legal identity. I have as much legal identity as far as a birth certificate as what Max Egan does. So there you go. You go and prove now that I am the person that you say I am and am I a person that actually legally exists that you can actually sue and if I'm not that person, who is that person that you need to find that is the legal person on the birth certificate that can actually be held accountable under law. So you go find that, Billy, okay? Because I've just proven to you, Kerry Cashel doesn't exist. <laughs> you like that one? Serious, Billy? Prove it. Go find a birth certificate for Kerry Cashel. Doesn't exist. Just like one doesn't exist for Max Egan. Telling you true. <laughs> and on that, I'm going to leave it today. I think I've made it long enough. And uh, I'll catch you next time. Bye.